What are some crazy World War II facts you know? When in retreat, the Nazis would booby trap pictures on the walls and leave them slightly crooked. They did this to entice officers to straighten them and set off an explosion. I would be dead so fast. I'd pick up something shiny and probably blow myself in half. I think it was the Viet Cong that started putting bombs in soda cans after noticing American troops would kick them while walking down the street. Another of the VC's tricks was to take a spent law's rocket tube and fill it with grenades then hook it to a tripwire. Yeah, I'm going with treat in that scenario. Operation Cottage, on August 15, 1943. Canadian SNDS troops decided to attack Japanese troops from opposite sides of the island. But they didn't know that Japanese army left the island two weeks prior. Canadian and US troops mistook each other for Japanese and started shooting. Friendly fire resulted in 28 Americans and 4 Canadians killed. Total 313 casualties while there was no enemy. Edit, as I was corrected, some of the casualties were caused by Japanese traps left on the island. Edit 2, I don't think anyone won anything. Both lost. That was tragic. Winston Churchill had an oxygen mask for flying an airplane specially made for him that would allow him to smoke cigars while he had the mask on. Also he had a doctor's prescription for alcohol so he could have his few bevies during prohibition in America. Medicinally pissed. That prescription may have actually been warranted given how severe withdrawals can be for serious alcoholics. The United States produced 150% more planes in 1944 alone than Japan did in the whole war. I heard a podcast about that. The Japanese hand built their zeros in a factory that was 50 miles from the nearest runway and used oxen to carry them one by one to the runway for takeoff. Edit, the podcast is Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. The episode is called Supernova in the East. DanCarlin.com Yep, they were too fragile for trucks and there was no railhead near the factory where they were produced. Edit, Dan Carlin did indeed cover this in his hardcore history podcast Supernova in the East. There are six parts. Yang Kyungjong was a Korean soldier who fought in the Japanese, Soviet, and Nazi Germany armies. He was caught by us forces in France. I saw a documentary on this. It was not by choice. He was drafted each time. Edit, I found it. It's not much of a documentary but it has more information. www.youtube.com watch? Vup tf 0 qqk There was no coffee in major German cities for much of World War II because of supply lines being disrupted. But they made up for the lack of coffee by switching to meth-filled chocolate. Our coffee machine is broken at work. This could be an interesting substitute. Mora soldiers died in World War II in accidents, automobile plane crashes, fires, falls, etc., than combat deaths in the entire Vietnam War. The amount of people killed in World War II is staggering. More than 70 million. For comparison there are only 19 countries today whose current population is bigger than amount of people that died in six years of war. Where's that video that shows how many Soviets die in comparison to literally everyone else? That was absolutely mind-boggling edit, here it is. Amazing video that everyone should watch and the ending hits differently with current events the fallen of World War II. A Finnish soldier took a whole bottle of Pervitin and skied 400 kilometers in a matter of days. He was high for 14 days. During World War II, amphetamine and methamphetamine were used extensively by Allied and Axis forces for their stimulant and performance-enhancing effects. Plus drugged up troops will be brutal. The War on Drugs versus the War on drugs. Only about 4% of Londoners used the tube stations for bomb shelters in the Blitz. About 40% used Anderson shelters under their back gardens or cage-like shelters in their homes. The rest stayed in their usual bedrooms and hoped for the best. You might be interested in this, but Albania built enough bomb shelters for their entire population during the Cold War. Under the regime of Enver Hoxha. My parents were 8 when the war broke out. My mother is 91 in April. During the Cold War my father was all for building a bomb shelter at the side of our house. My grandfather served on the Western Front, and less than a week after arriving in France, his unit got captured by the Germans. He was in a POW camp for less than 24 hours, escaping when the French resistance raided the camp. 
he spent most of the war hiding with the French resistance. I've been told this mainly consisted of smoking and drinking in the woods, and playing golf most nights with hand-whittled clubs and balls. The French resistance was badass. People always make fun of the French for surrendering but that was their government. Many citizens were risking their lives to do things like you described. And if caught, horrible things awaited them. Hell yeah. And people like to mock the resistance as not being very helpful, but their page on Wikipedia is lengthy. Those guys were busy, and most of them were extremely young to boot. Nothing but respect for them. To be fair, there were many different resistance groups that did not like each other. They were very busy, but their efforts were both against the German occupier and each other. And when you compare them to the Polish resistance, it kinda takes the wind out of their sails. The Polish resistance was so hardcore that a guy forged papers to get arrested and sent to Auschwitz to prove what was going on to the Allies. Holy shit that is one of the most badass things I've ever heard. HTTPS n.wikipedia.org wikiwai tolpolecki There's a tree, I think it is about 500 years old but can't remember, that survived the bombing of Hiroshima. It still stands in the city. There are many trees that survived the bombings, actually. The Japanese call them Hibaku Jimoku. I believe one of them is an Australian eucalyptus tree, which makes sense that it survived TBH. The Soviet 13th Guards Rifle Division, one of the units in the Battle of Stalingrad, suffered 30% killed in the first day of fighting. Just 320 of the original 10,000 soldiers survived the entire battle. On the very first day of the German advance into the city itself, as the Germans were overrunning Soviet positions right up to the Volga, all formations in the vicinity were given orders to immediately proceed to the city, including the, the 13th Guards Rifles, who were in the middle of their resupply and recruitment phase after suffering over 50% losses in the Battle of Kharkov. The 13th Guards immediately rushed to the Volga, and at 5 p.m. on the very first day, conducted a river crossing under hostile fire, in order to reinforce the Soviet rearguard which at this point was at brigade strength. The Vanguard Regiment suffered 50% casualty to launch their assault across the Volga and to secure the crossing for the rest of their division, who would follow. In the following days, the division participated in some of the most brutal and famous fighting in Stalingrad, such as the railway station and Pavlov's house. The entirety of its 10,000 would be lost during the Battle of Stalingrad, and out of a Soviet rifle division, a mere company remained. The incredible stories of bravery and savagery that comes out of World War II never ever ceases to amaze me. I remember reading a British officer's description of the bravest actions of the war that he witnessed. The second bravest was during Operation Market Garden, when troops from the US 82nd Airborne made their daylight crossing of the river wall to secure the other side near the bridge they wanted to take. It was daylight, the attempt to cover them with smoke from artillery fire didn't work too well, they didn't have the right boats and most of them had to paddle with their rifle butts. As seen in a bridge too far, the Germans opened fire and they took heavy casualties. Enough managed to make it across to secure the riverbank and hold it for a few hours. The bravest? The next wave of troops saw this unfold, and when the boats returned got right into them and made the crossing. I live in Nijmegen and have crossed that bridge by foot and car a lot. It still baffles me that all of this happened right there. FDR didn't really care who his vice president was his last term even though he was practically already dying. Party officials picked Harry Truman and FDR almost never included him in any decision-making even after they were elected. When FDR died a couple months into their term Truman wasn't really in the loop on what exactly was happening with the executive branch and ending World War II. A couple months later he dropped the atomic bombs on Japan. This reminds me of a story I read recently something about how after FDR passed, Truman went to Eleanor to offer his condolences and he asked her to let him know if there was anything he could do for her and she basically said oh Harry, is there anything I can do for you? She really knew and understood the gravity of the mantle that was befalling him at that moment. Eleanor is also believed to have done a lot of the president's job those last couple years because FDR was so ill. She knew a lot about what was going on, and probably could have given a lot of advice to Truman. Reminds me of Woodrow Wilson near the end of his term when Edith Wilson was pretty much managed the rest of the presidency while Woodrow was bedridden from a stroke. Joseph Kennedy, Jr., the eldest brother of President John Kennedy was killed in World War II as part of Operation Aphrodite. Operation Aphrodite involved flying unmanned bombers into targets. 
Kennedy was killed after arming the explosives in an unmanned bomber but before the crew bailed out. Joe Kennedy, Jr. died working on the precursor to the modern-day drone. And Joe Jr. was the son that Joe S.R. wanted to be president. Apparently he was the favorite son, and John was seen as rebellious and sickly. Joe S.R. was a bit harsh with all of his kids, including the daughter he had lobotomized.